one of the things that struck me is a lot of society's investment, as is true across the whole criminal justice system, is into the detection and punishment of offenders, and hardly any of it is invested into the prevention of these crimes in the first place. Hello, and thanks for joining us for another episode of Prostasia Foundation's podcast vodcast series, Sex, Human Rights and CSA Prevention. Today, we're talking to Andrew Putterfat, who is chair of the Internet Watch Foundation. Andrew was the first speaker at our recent multi-stakeholder dialogue on internet platforms, sexual content and child protection. And this is an extended version of the talk that he gave at that event. Just an apology that the video quality is not great, but please persevere because Andrew has some wonderful things to say. So Andrew, thank you very much for joining us for this chat and uh, also joining us remotely at our multi-stakeholder dialogue. Yeah, sorry I couldn't be at the meeting. I have a slight medical procedure to go through, nothing serious, but um, I'll be there, so I'm sorry about that. No worries. Well, best, best wishes for that procedure. Now, uh, you and I have uh, collaborated for a number of years uh, since before either of us was directly involved in the child protection space. And can I just say that your path in becoming chair of the Internet Watch Foundation has been personally quite inspirational to me because it showed that really we're all on the same side, that the human rights... Uh, community and the child protection community really need to be in this together. Um, do, do you have any thoughts on that? What what drew you into this space? It, it's exactly that, Jeremy. I, I, what I've noticed over the years, and I'm sure it's true for you, <coughs> is that the child protection and the safety community in general, people concerned with safety, just meet in a different place from the people concerned. And because I think, you know, a declaration is something that's always inspired me, and there's a right to be free and safe as a as a key human right in Article 3. I've always wondered, why can't we be in the same space thinking about things? So when the Internet Watch Foundation uh, chair post came up, um, I thought about it and thought, why don't I do this and go, and go to them and say explicitly, I'm a human rights person, I want to take this from a human rights angle, I believe passionately in freedom of expression, but I also believe in, in not exploiting small children. And I didn't know how they'd take it, but actually I had an incredibly positive feedback. They were really keen to have me as a candidate for the chair. And obviously at the end of the day, I was appointed by the board. One of the things, you know, it's, it's really a small personal attempt to bridge that gap between people who worry about the, the kind of stuff that's online and people who want to defend the good stuff. And my view is if we don't find the right way of defeating and dealing with uh, the bad stuff, the sewage, if you like, the ecosystem, we risk losing all the great things that the internet represents, all the positive va values and all the freedoms and openness and access to information and ideas that, that, it, that it's brought us. And I think we are at the moment where if we don't figure out how to deal with the sewage, it's going to put the whole atmosphere and lead governments, as they're already doing, down the path of let control and shut down because it's just liberated all the bad forces and it'll cause them to lose sight of all the positive things so that's, that's that's been really my main they say my main motivation i mean it's been a, a powerful motivation for me taking on this particular role so the internet watch foundation's uh, 2018 annual report was released quite recently and you wrote a preface to that report can you give us a few highlights from the report what are some of the most important takeaways for most people, we, you know, we don't see the content that involves children being abused because we're not. You've got to look for it to find it. You, it's very hard to stumble across it accidentally, even if you're using, you know, traditional pornographic websites. You need to make a positive step to do that. So the volume surprises me. It alarms me that there's so much increasing material of children under three, which implies a very, very, uh, you, you know, a very difficult phenomenon for us to deal with. Um, and I suppose the third thing that occurred to me, and, and it's happened in my time as chair, that we're going to fix this by simply content and not addressing the men who want to access this content in the first place. And to me, the analogy is like the drugs war. You don't win the drugs war by suppressing the supply of drugs because you never can suppress the supply of drugs. You can disrupt it. You can make it more expensive. You can create more penalties for people who are uh, promoting it or, or distributing it, but you'll never eliminate it. And I think one of the things that struck me is 
a lot of society's investment, as is true across the whole criminal justice system, is into the detection and punishment of offenders. And hardly any of it is invested into the prevention of these crimes in the first place. So that's something now that I'm, you know, we're talking about as a foundation. I'm raising it with other organizations like us around the world and saying, what can we do to take a stronger um, approach to preventing, when I say preventing, intersecting men, that pathway that they take when they move from one piece of material to another and end up watching, you know, really horrible material of children being abused. No one starts like that. No one's born like that. There's a journey they undertake. How do we intercept that journey? What can technology do? What can counselling do? There's some very interesting things happening in Finland and Sweden where they're linking the detection of of material to the provision of of counselling services to men who recognise there's kind of a problem with what they're they're doing. And that's something I'd like to kind of generalise and and do more proactively in this country. So I think those were the things that really stood out for me uh, at the sort of the volume of content that we were dealing with last year, which is not going down. It's not clearing. And we're obviously only seeing, because of our people limitations, we don't go pay sites you know a, a lot of material is hidden behind walls where you have to provide material yourself on a group or you pay to access that material and that's not something we have permission from law enforcement to do so there's a whole load of areas we can't even look for material but we know it's there yeah so I, you know i just think prevention it's yeah. uh, months well, that, it's interesting that you say that. And I, I strongly agree. And in fact, that's one of the um, founding principles behind Prostasia Foundation is that if we can prevent uh, an act of child sexual abuse, it's far better than just uh, pursuing offenders uh, after the fact. Um, and, and this does mean working with people um, who uh, some of them may be pedophiles, some of them may not be. Some of them are just people who, you know, find themselves with a, an addiction or, a, a you know, a a compulsion to seek out certain types of images, and uh, and those are the people that we need to reach out to 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 stop them, as you say, on that pathway. And that's one of the things we're going to be talking about today at this meeting. So, um, in the report, uh, I, I noticed we, we did. Sorry, we, we, no, we've done some interesting. Sorry, we've done some interesting projects with, say, a couple of Premier League football clubs. I mean, the, the child demographic we've looked at is men between 16 and 24, which is when they begin to develop a predilection to look for that kind of material. And it, and it comes from usually an intensive um, test of pornography and then wanting to sort of step up because the material they're looking at no longer stimulates them. Uh, but we've done some interesting partnerships with a, a, a website called Lad Bible, which is a kind of a network for young men to football, dating, clothes and so on. So I, I think what's important is to also understand the demographics of this. I mean, there obviously are much older men who use material, much older men, and often older men who actually make it and distribute it. But the real, I think for us, the real key target group is that young, those young guys, 14, 15, 16, coming up to their early 20s, who are just discovering sexuality. And if we can, you know, turn them to a healthy sexuality, and a positive sexuality and away from uh, positive material. I think. So I think our partnerships become very interesting to us. You know, who we partner with becomes very important because we need to partner with those people who have reach and interest from young men. So that's, that's, that's the kind of areas we're looking at at the moment. So uh, it's interesting that you should say that uh, reaching out to young people is, is one of the most important uh, ways of stopping them from turning into uh, people who commit offences. Um, because uh, sometimes we've found, as Prostasia Foundation, censorship of child sexual abuse material can go too far and turn into censorship of forums that are discussing child sexual abuse prevention. And uh, we have an example that we'll be talking about at the meeting where there was a, a, a chat forum uh, for people who found themselves uh, attracted to minors. Uh, there was no sharing of images allowed in this forum, uh, but the internet platform shut that forum down. Um, and as a result, uh, a, a possible avenue of support w- was gone. Um, so I'd like to talk to you a bit more about how can we avoid over-censoring? How can we avoid 
um, censoring material that may actually be helpful rather than harmful in the fight against child sexual abuse. And uh, I noticed that uh, in the IWF's latest uh, annual report, you have a classification of the types of material that's uh, being blocked or, or removed. Um, category 1 includes the most serious images of minors being sexually abused. Category 2 is also other sexual conduct by minors. And then Category 3 is everything else. Now, under UK law, um, isn't it true that some of the images in Category 3 are not actually images of real children? They're cartoons or, or other uh, fictional representations. Is, are they also included in the images that are added to the IWF uh, block list and URL list? We, um, firstly, we operate, obviously, at, because we, we have to work with law enforcement, we operate to the legal definition of what's illegal content. And that, in, in our case, excludes um, what you might call pornographic content of a, of a general kind, uh, including, um, you know, schoolgirl videos, you know, things which are where there's a simulation of taboo sexuality, but actually it doesn't involve actors and actresses, and that's very clear in the kind of the thing. And actually, when I did my induction into the images, we spent a lot of time, uh, the, the hotline trainer spent a lot of time showing me stuff which you think would involve young children, but actually, because of the angle that was used and the way it was filmed, actually turned out to be adults. So a lot of what we do is not, re not, not include images that actually are, we think, lawful, but which many people looking at would think were unlawful. Having said that, we operate to that legal definition. We do separate out those categories in making the URLs available, and it is open to a company not to take, say, the category C or category B image and only take the category A images. So, it, you know, we say this is what's illegal under British law. This is, you know, the thing, the URLs we block. But there are companies who, for whatever reason, don't take our B and C images because in the United States, for example, while there's a close um, uh, alignment of the law on what we would call the most serious, that, you know, the category A images, uh, categories, what we would call categories B and C in the UK, are different to, to the US things that are allowed in the US that aren't allowed legally in the UK and so US companies will choose may choose not to take you know not to take those in not to take that category C because it doesn't comply with US law or they will take the US legal definition so it's a little bit it's a little bit kind of messy because you're operating in different jurisdictions but generally the US companies will operate to a US understanding of what is illegal and the UK companies will operate to to our to, to the UK standard so that's, that's, that, that's the kind of situation, I think. So can you address more specifically whether there are some, uh, you know, fictional cartoon representations that are included in the Category C list? Because those can be illegal under UK law. Yeah, I'm not, a, I mean, to be honest, I'm not aware of those. And I've not, it's an issue that's been discussed about how we'd respond to that. But I'm not aware that that is the bulk of the cat. I'm not aware that that comprises the category C images. Mm. I think they're mostly uh, self-filmed. I mean, they include, you know, girls filming themselves, doing things to themselves, playing right. themselves. Yeah. Category C. It tends to be uh, more moderate images. But I'm not aware of them actually being cartoons. So the reason why I, I asked, I, I would need to check. Yeah. Sorry. The reason why I asked this is because I'd need to check. Yeah. Well, I'd appreciate it if, if you might look into that, because one of the things that's uh, important, I'm sure you'll agree, is uh, the transparency and accountability of the work that's done in this sector. And I think the IWF has done a great job in, in sort of raising the standard there. Um, but do you feel that there's anything more that we can do uh, in this sector to increase the transparency and accountability of the work? To be honest, I think, you know, I'm not saying the model we've got is perfect, but as you know, as you probably know, Jeremy, if you've looked at our model, firstly, no image is blocked unless a, a human analyst has viewed it. That's not the case with all hotlines. There are hotlines around the world that will simply recommend a blocking on the basis of an algorithmic search, and we think that's wrong. Yeah. Secondly, every about a, a sample of every image that is recommended to be blocked is reviewed by two senior staff for quality assurance. So there's an independent process of review to decide whether or not it's, it should be taken down. 
Thirdly, we have an independent audit conducted periodically by a senior judge, uh, who, as in any other audit process, will take a selection of the Im images that we've chosen to block, and, and he'll make, they'll make the selection, and they'll review them against the law to make sure we're compliant with the law. And fourthly, although we're a, a private charity, we said that we're, we have, are happy to answer a judicial review inquiry, which I guess most people there know what that is. What that means is, for the purposes of reviewing our decisions, we're happy to be treated as a public body because we're performing a kind of public function. Mm. And you can challenge our decision in, in court if you believe we've removed things uh, incorrectly. Uh, that's uh, certainly not happened in my time and not happened in the last few years since the organisation has narrowed the scope of its remit to those very clearly uh, illegal images. I think the other thing we do, where I think people can learn is, A, we only deal with this kind of material. We don't deal with violence. Mm -hmm. We don't deal with other forms of illegal material which are out there um, because we regard that as having a separate specialism requiring a separate or say terrorist content etc we won't deal with anything like that we've been asked to, to take on those things and i think we've taken the view that it's important for us to have a narrow for any organization to have a narrow focus and we also provide quite extensive training for our analysts we provide psychological support every so every two months they have access to, they have someone on call the whole time, they have a two month review and they have a one year in-depth um, psychological evaluation by a very eminent psychiatrist. And I think compared to the private companies like Facebook or Google who employ often contractors, you know, looking at material where they've got no real idea what the law is and there's no psychological support you know, these, these are where I think that it all goes badly wrong. You know, if you've got a bunch of people in the Philippines sitting in a shed looking at pornography all day, trying to decide what should and shouldn't be shown, you're going to get, you know, you're going to get A, some very, very disturbed people in the Philippines at the end of that day, and you're going to get some pretty bad decisions. So I would say the big lesson for us is having high-quality scrutiny that is accountable uh, uh, you know, for any decisions that it makes. And I think that's something where the big companies employing lots of invigilators should really look at their processes. And obviously, for most small companies, you know, startups, they haven't got the resource no. to put into this kind of thing. So I think the advantage of our model is you can be a very small startup, you know, you maybe have five people, four, four people running some kind of platform where there's a lot of traffic. You haven't got the time to actually scrutinise that traffic for what's illegal or not, so we can provide that material for you. So I think, I think centralising, you know, keeping the function very narrow, tying it to the law, making it accountable, having it done by high quality analysts, but making it available to all size companies across the board. I'd say that's an important lesson for for other organisations engaged in this kind of work. Mm. So uh, lawmakers in the UK are. Are considering new rules uh, that would compel internet platforms to to step up their game. Um, an online harms white paper has been released suggesting that there ought to be a duty of care on internet platforms to uh, prevent harms to children. Uh, and I understand that the IWF, uh, although supporting this in principle, has got some concerns. Would you like to explain what those concerns are? I think it's it's largely that the, the white paper doesn't provide any detail. A, it doesn't, I would say, my major concern is it doesn't... There's a, there's a French proposal, for example, for bringing social media into a regulatory framework. But the French proposal gives equal weight to freedom of expression as it does to the protections that are necessary. And I think with all of these things, one has to balance the rights and freedoms online against the need to protect people and make them safe. And I think the, the, the problem in the white paper that they haven't figured out, and I think they're fairly open about this, is that there's a number of what they call legal legal harms, you know, harmful behaviours which are legal, bullying, trolling, you know, abusing women, etc., where they think the company should have a duty of care, but it's not clear how the companies are meant to interpret that. I mean, I, I, I don't think you can outsource fine judgments to private companies to make about 
you know, areas which are inevitably going to, going to be contested in terms of people's right to express themselves. I just think it's wrong to do that. You know, there needs to be a very clear legal boundary where you say this is legal expression and this is not legal expression. And that's the boundary you can then expect the companies to police for themselves, subject to some transparency and accountability. But I, I think at the moment there's a lack of definition about what is meant by harm, which means the duty of care floats in a slightly... What, what's it going to mean? And obviously the danger is for a company that they'll simply over-remove material they've got any concerns about, you know, that the, they won't test the boundary. So I had a very interesting... At a very interesting meeting the other week with uh, a senior official in a major social media company. It was a private meeting, so I can't, I'm afraid, say more than that about the situation in Germany and the net DGZ law, which I'm sure most people in your meeting will know requires companies to remove certain, you know, hate speech content in a short period of time or face massive fines. And he says he's been spending all his time just removing stuff, just removing things. And then the German courts are reinstating it. The German courts are then saying, actually, that's not hate speech. You shouldn't have taken that down. Put it back on. And, and he said it's just it's like a ping pong match because he doesn't have the clarity in his mind about what he should remove. So, and it's only when the courts give him that decision that he understands where those boundaries lie. So those, those are, the, I think, the obvious dangers, that in an area like this, it's important to have legal clarity. And I, I, mean, I take the view... That there are some problems that can be fixed. Let's fix the problems that we can fix. And if there are other areas which are complex or troubling or difficult, let's approach that in a more thoughtful way and not pile it all into the same piece of legislation. Mm. I think what you said about trying to maintain a narrow focus um, is crucial in the sense that a lot of people don't want to consider um, child protection or terrorism as subjects that require due process, that require transparency or accountability, because the consequences of, uh, of child sexual offending or terrorism are so terrible, and they are terrible. Um, but the problem is if we don't stick to, uh, to the rule of law and to human rights uh, in this area, then there tends to be a creep uh, whereby these standards are relaxed in other areas as well. So I, I, I really... Uh, applaud again at the work that you're doing. Are there any closing thoughts that you'd like to leave uh, our meeting with about, uh, you know, how you see uh, online child protection moving uh, or anything that uh, our participants ought to know about? Well, I think, I think the difficulty in the United States, if I can say this, is the, the political culture, which is driven a lot by a certain kind of moral approach. Yes. Which tends to lump a whole series of issues in together. And issues which ought to be kept quite distinct. So, you know, the whole question of um, sexual material, for example, sexual practices between adults, that's nothing to do with child abuse. You know, that, that, that is, the, the, you know, from what I know and I understand of men who go on that path, that's a very particular path that goes down in a very particular direction and often has involved men who've had very little sexual contact with other people and actually would benefit from having sexual relationships with others, however those are constructed. So I think the danger is to say, you know, we have a problem of... I, I don't call it child... I call it child abuse, actually, child abuse imagery, because I don't... I separate it out from sexuality, which I think is a good thing and a healthy thing and a necessary part of society and one that should be treated with, you know, respect to liberty you know, and dignity and you know, a degree of social liberalism from the abuse of, of minors who can't who can't defend themselves and I and can't answer back and who who suffer un unbelievable horrors because of what's done to them. And I and I, I just think you know, the difficulty I think you guys have from what I see of the political debates in America is the ability and the inability to separate out that kind of abuse that you're trying to deal with in Prostasia from the wider discussion about sexuality in society. That which seems to me to be a separate kind of conversation and not one to be lumped together. Absolutely. I'm not sure that's helpful to you, um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, because, you know, we, you know, we don't have that, you know, in that sense, we don't have that situation in the UK. Uh, there's a whole range of things that are possible here legally that are not possible legally in the United States. And I think we're probably better off for that. 
Well, thank you very much, Andrew, for, for those words. Uh, it's been a great conversation with you. Uh, and uh, once again, thank you for your time. Pleasure. And good, good luck with the event today. I hope it all goes well. Thank you. Bye-bye for now. Thanks. And thank you for watching this episode. If you want to make sure you don't miss future episodes, please make sure to subscribe. You can also donate to help us with our work. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time on Sex, Human Rights, and CSA Prevention.